Hi there, this is philosopher and existential psychotherapist Emmy van Dersen and I'm reading an essay that I first wrote for BBC3 radio program The Essay on Being an Existential Therapist. So being an existential psychotherapist means being a philosopher who applies philosophical ideas and methods to the concrete challenges and realities of everyday human existence. I work with people who struggle with life to the extent that most of them are treated with antidepressants or other medication. And I try to help them to understand and rise above their plight and find new purpose. As I'm also a counselling psychologist, my work is based in facts and evidence rather than in intellectual theorising, wishful thinking or popular opinion. As Camus put it, the only serious philosophical question is whether life is or is not worth living. And as many people doubt the value and the meaning of their life, this unbalances them. And it may even throw them into distress or despair. Existential therapy seeks to clarify and illuminate a person's life in light of the big questions of human beings. Lifting them out of their darkness and confusion to place them where they can see the whole picture and get a sense of perspective. When a person gets clarity about purpose and knows what contribution they want to make to the world, their sense of meaning is rekindled and they get a new appetite for life. Existential psychotherapy is the only established form of psychotherapy that is directly based in philosophy rather than in psychology or in medicine. Its roots reach very deeply, all the way back to the ancients, especially to Socrates. Existential therapy was officially founded at the beginning of the last century with the philosophy of Jaspers and the psychiatric practice of Ludwig Binswanger, Medard Boss and Viktor Frankl. Frankl's logotherapy, or therapy of meaning, was inspired by his own life and work, first in suicide prevention and then when he was interned in concentration camps where he was sometimes able to work as a doctor. So he noted that some people just gave up in these situations, while others found ways of giving life a deeper meaning that got them through the madness and horror. Jaspers gave up his psychiatry training to become a philosopher. Boss and Binswanger looked to philosophy for new ways of tackling mental and emotional problems. They took the paradoxes and conflicts of their patients so seriously that they sought to deal with them more effectively and much more directly. R.D. Lang attempted something similar in this country in the 60s and 70s, creating therapeutic communities which provided alternative living spaces for people who were struggling with their emotional survival and who did not want to be consigned to mental hospitals are pumped full of medication. Well, I came to the UK in 1977 to work with this movement, and I lived and worked in one of those communities, immersing myself in people's problems and experimenting with alternative ways of approaching mental illness. Before I came to the UK to participate in this experiment, I trained and worked residentially in psychiatric hospitals in France for many years. Although I was born and raised in the Netherlands, I became involved in psychiatry through my relationship with a French medical student 
when I was myself a philosophy student in Montpellier in the early 1970s. Now he decided to specialize in psychiatry at the same time as I decided to specialize in psychotherapy, so that our disparate interest, medicine and philosophy, could come together. My study of the works of psychoanalytic authors during that period, like Freud and Jung, Lacan, Deleuze and Irigaray, did not satisfy my search for a philosophical way to practice. As I joined my new psychiatrist husband in his work in various psychiatric settings, first with autistic children, then with young anorexic women, I was shocked at the kind of care that was given, or rather the lack of care that was given. I found that so many people, as soon as they became patients, lost their own voice and self-respect and gave up their agency and their humanity as they became dependent on medical care and really on chemicals. It became essential to seek out places where this was not the case and where we could relate to those with mental and emotional problems in a more humane way. So we chose to work and live in a revolutionary psychiatric hospital in the Massif Central in the small town of saint alban in Lozère, which was the birthplace of French social and community therapy. Here I was able to apply my philosophical knowledge to my work with individual patients and also with groups, working at the social centre of the hospital. After that I went back to university to qualify as a clinical psychologist, doing research on loneliness and attempted suicide, as I wanted now to develop a method to help people understand their shipwrecked lives much better, and I realised that the time had come to develop my own way of working, my own existential approach. My deep connection with existential ideas came from my early background in the Netherlands. I was born in The Hague, some years after the end of the Second World War. My parents had joined the Theosophical Society, an organisation that looked at the great world religions to try and make sense of spirituality in a more pluralistic way. When my primary school teacher asked everyone in our class to state their religion, I really wasn't sure what to say, and I went home to ask my parents. So my dad jokingly suggested that I should tell my teacher that I was a heathen. This scandalised my mother, who thought I should call myself an atheist or an agnostic. I found these terms troublesome and deeply wanting, for I did not want to be defined by what I was not. I decided that I would carry on my whole life to search for truth, to come to some better understanding of all these complex issues and to make up my own mind about what I wanted to believe and what I wanted to devote my life to. And it is the thus that I discovered philosophy. I already had deep and secret beliefs of my own, and I wanted to commit my entire soul to something that was true and good and worthwhile, rather than just stating that I was an unbeliever or a doubter. I loved nature, and I loved freedom, and fairness, and kindness, I loved the sunshine on the North Sea waves, the wind sweeping me along or challenging me on my bike through the dunes. And I loved going camping with my parents for four weeks each summer, tracking through Europe with little tents, meeting people from different countries, learning languages, realising just how many different sorts of people there were and how many different sorts of existence there were for each person to choose from. I learned to be more resourceful 
and less afraid of other people's opinions. And I wanted to find out more about what was possible in life. For most of the year, we lived in a very confined situation in a tiny third floor flat in the North Sea dunes at the southwest of The Hague. We looked out towards the sea on one side, but on all other sides there were rows of newly built flats and post-war construction sites in which we used to play. My elder sister and I shared a tiny box room which was so compact that one of our beds had to be stored under the other in the daytime. We were never left in any doubt that we were lucky to have even this modest space. Never mind if others were better off. We had what we needed and we should be grateful. And we should know that life would improve if we tried our hardest. The stories our parents told us about the war were quite harrowing. The Hague had been occupied by the Nazis for five years and it had been bombed regularly by the Allied forces after big bombings by the Germans at first. My father had been hidden in a freezing loft and was in danger of his life, especially in that last winter of 1944-1945. During what is known as the Dutch Famine, when the west of Holland was being deliberately starved by the occupiers. My dad had contracted pneumonia, double pneumonia, and he very nearly died on several occasions. My mother was a trainee nurse, and she looked after children who were suffering from starvation, diphtheria, tetanus and tuberculosis. Our maternal grandparents had lost their home and all their possessions twice over. First when they were bombed in The Hague by the Germans, and then by the Allies when they had moved to Arnhem. Several of my uncles and great-uncles had been deported to Nazi labour camps, or had been summarily shot in the street whilst resisting arrest. No wonder that my parents were very deeply traumatised by it all, and talked to us about these terrible things continuously during our early years. I read avidly to find out more about life and the world, and I listened to music to surpass it all and to find peace in myself. I just wanted to get out of the Netherlands as soon as I could, really, feeling confined there and frightened in some ways. As a student in France, I read much, much more than I had read as a teenager and a child. And people like Flaubert and Proust and Rousseau and Baudelaire and Verlaine and Valéry and so many others inspired me deeply to free myself from some of those early years of oppression and fears. I became immersed in phenomenology after reading Descartes and Hegel and moving on to Husserl and Heidegger and Nietzsche and Sartre and Merleau-Ponty and discovering a new favourite quite separately in Spinoza, who I thought very, very highly of and read avidly. But of course there were also the novels and the plays and reading Camus, Sartre, Anouy and de Beauvoir was intoxicating and also a little bit terrifying at times. I was very fortunate to study for my master's in philosophy with Michel Henry, an existential philosopher who was inspirational in the way in which he drew wisdom from controversy and who remained aloof from academic rivalries, something I've always remembered. He gave me the confidence to pursue my therapeutic practice as a form of applied philosophy and got quite interested in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy through our discussions and later wrote a book about it. The defining idea of existential therapy is that it is philosophy in practice. Applied philosophy for everyday life. There is no 
constructive picture of the human psyche and no ideas about what the essence of being is. It is rather a search for that and a recognition that it is different for everybody and that it is very different in each culture and that we need to keep an open mind and a neutral position for a proper investigation of how a person experiences their life. For human beings evolve as they become more conscious and as they change their position and their situation in the world. Our views and our beliefs are always situational. People create their lives out of what has been given to them and what their early experiences are and also in terms of what they manage to understand about their life and make of all those experiences. So it can change and we can transform ourselves as we get more established in life. And of course human life is a relatively brief experience which starts with conception and birth and ends in death, totally predictable and certainly and which leaves each of us to be responsible to make something meaningful out of what happens in between. The golden rule of phenomenology is to describe rather than to interpret. And this allows us to practice the the, to approach the mystery of human consciousness in a careful and a respectful manner. Noticing that life is rather different according to our different culture situations and circumstances, though we have many fundamental experiences in common. And of course we are all capable of transcending our early troubles and problems and givens to some extent. And the more we reflect on it, the better we become at transforming and transcending and making ourselves into what we are capable of being. This is to be free, to find our capacity for exercising choice. But of course to have choice is to also be anxious about making the right choices. And anxiety or angst is a core experience of human living. Anxiety is not just a symptom of mental illness. In existential therapy it is never dismissed as a weakness, on the contrary. As long as we are alive rather than dead, we will be anxious, for energy will flow in us. Whenever we take responsibility or take a new direction, we put energy into our actions. But when the action is not possible, it might, the energy might turn around and whirl around and create turbulence inside of us, which can turn into turmoil and panic and is experienced as angst. Anxiety though is the price we pay for making choices and having responsibility for our own lives. Anxiety calls us to become ourselves and reflect on our existence. It is the shadow side of freedom, and we cannot have freedom without anxiety. As Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, put it so nicely, learning to be anxious in the right way is learning the ultimate. The right way here, of course, is to be keyed up enough to come to life and to live it to the full, but not to become so tense or worried about things that we become dysfunctional. Anxiety is also distinct and different from fear. Anxiety is a generalized feeling of unheimlichkeit, or not being at home, as Heidegger put it. It is a sense of not being at ease in the world, but it is a dis-ease, but not a disease. Anxiety is a given for all of us. Fear is something quite different. It has a concrete object which incites us to see that 
the, the object it takes as its um, object is a threat to us. And so our fear is a message to us that we're shrinking away from this threat and that we should flee and save ourselves from what is a danger. But of course, if we flee from much of what goes on in the world, we end up becoming disenfranchised because we become disconnected. That makes us unmotivated and even despairing. And this is what many people call depression, when it is actually a form of decompression or disconnection or even suppression and keeping down of our energy because our energy terrifies us and the world seems too dangerous to engage with. Courage leads to re-engagement and engagement leads to reconnection and reconnection creates meaning in the world. The more we are connected, the more meaning there is in the world. So courage and action and reconnection are better remedies than avoidance, evasion and medication. The application of existential ideas to psychotherapy means that clients are not offered reassurance or interpretations, but are encouraged to explore their anxiety and consider it as a good starting point for the work that has to be done. They are alive, they have energy, they feel it in themselves. It's terrifying, but it means they can do it, they can change. So we help them face the facts and find the resilience to make changes for the better, affirming their freedom and their capacity for choice. Always in an open and fair-minded conversation and with a view to exploring the consequences of choices with a careful weighing up of rights and duties, because both are important. Philosophy can benefit all of us, not just psychotherapy clients, for it encourages us to develop moral and existential principles for ourselves and to think about those things and to take them seriously and to find out how we want to live. Such ideas help us to live to the full and make much, much more of the time given to us, which is a short time. It helps us to be unafraid of the inevitable suffering that we will also experience. It will help us to not shirk and to plumb our own depth to find out who we are and what we are capable of and what our talents are. When sometimes all those good things about us just get locked up and they get locked away together with our passions. So by evading our fears, we end up also shortchanging ourselves and not having access to our passions and our taste for life. When I work with my clients, I aim to help them understand their lives better, understand themselves better, and to regain a sense of balance and balancing I also help them to find a broader perspective and to get a sense of direction again and to find the meaning that they had lost or had purloined or perhaps had never found in the first place. And hopefully they will discover to their delight that times of crisis or mom are moments for reflection and learning, rather than just moments where we should rush into panicky action or where we should allow ourselves to be reactive in life rather than active. So people learn to thrive on their anxiety and on their difficulties and to find their true depth when they are despairing and to realize that an upset is a time where you can 
plumb your depth and find a root in yourself that you may have had lost before. People who are engaged with something that is of value to them are always surprised about what they're capable of because they find fresh energy and purpose to engage with life in a new and wholehearted fashion. A calm and kind, peaceful, open dialogue which searches for meaning and searches for truth is all it takes. In that process, people learn to recognize the contradictions and paradoxes in their life. They find a way to face their troubles and solve their dilemmas. They learn to decide what is important and what is precious in life. I've done this job for over 40 years now and I continue to be amazed at people's resilience with troubles but also at their intelligence in overcoming their problems once they put their heart, their souls and their minds to it. Since it is Camus' 100th birthday this year I will end off on a couple of quotes by him for they sum it up so well what clients discover. As they face their fate and learn to love their life, Camus says it very elegantly and poignantly. In the depth of winter, I finally learned that there was in me an invincible summer and also happiness is nothing except the simple harmony between human beings and the life they lead. Have a good life. Make the most of what you've got. Make the best of what you are and contribute to the world and pass it on to other people while you can.